r slash self-help. Posted by not okay throwaway 12. How do I pretend that everything's okay when I actually want to puke from anxiety? Too long, didn't listen. We're having a lot of family Zoom meetings. We're having one in a few minutes, too. And I get very badly anxious before, during, and after them, but I don't want to let it show. For more context, I'm kind of part of a very big religious and close family. I say kind of because I no longer feel like I belong, since I hold a crucially different perspective compared to everyone else. For example, I very deeply value my education, whereas they keep indirectly nudging me to just give it up and work for the religion instead. It doesn't help that I no longer believe in the religion either, but they can't know that yet. Anyway, we've been holding Zoom meetings fairly often, and I get to see all my family more. I used to only see them around once or twice a year, I'm happy, but I'm also scared poopless. These family reunions have never been my thing, or rather, any kind of social event involving my family and religion has never been my thing. One time, during a sleepover event with some people from church, I broke down crying in the bathroom and begged my dad to pick me up and make some lame excuse for me. Another time, before a Bible study with my cousins, I straight up had a panic attack and started puking while being unable to breathe. So when my parents tell me over breakfast that, hey, we'll be having a group video call in less than an hour, my entire day is pretty much just panicking and damage control when the deed is done. I feel physically sick and nauseated, but I have to put up a happy front when the camera turns on. I'm so scared of letting my anxiety slip out even more, especially when my fingers are already shaking and scratching at my skin. Lastly, I used to cope with such issues by self-harming. Every night I'd be crying, trying to restrain myself from hurting myself. I'm glad I've been out of it for six months now, but every time that I get anxious that behavior pops up again, and I have no choice but to go with it until my palms bleed from my nails piercing them, or my fear and anxiety might spiral out of control. I really wish I could see a therapist or something, but it's going to take a while with the pandemic going on, and my religion doesn't really support getting mental help from actual scientific professionals anyway. So that leaves me to my last resort, pretending. I just need to know how to hold it in without breaking down right after, and I feel like I'll be fine for a bit. Osmed replied, can you say a little more about what your anxiety is about? Is it just being on group video calls, or your family specifically? Are you worried you'll accidentally slip out about how you're not invested in their religion? Would make it easier to give advice. OP replied, I suppose all three, but in varying degrees. I think it's mostly about my family. Even back then when I still believed in the religion, I always felt like I was walking on eggshells around them. And now that I no longer have the same perspective that they have, it's just really killing me to keep such a big secret. I'm sorry, I don't think this will be much help at all, haha. <laughs> it's somehow hard for me to explain. Basically, bad thoughts are all that come to my mind when I think of the word family. I think it's because throughout my childhood and up to now, I really haven't felt them being there for me when it counts. I do know what they're trying, though, and I love them, but it's just... Yeah. Every time I'm with my family, I have to push those bad thoughts away so I don't act off, and I think the added pressure of trying to please them just makes my anxiety skyrocket. Honestly, I'm mentally at my worst during every family event just because of this. I can't think properly. My sole focus is literally to not break down. After every event, I usually go to the bathroom and have a power sob. Osmed replied, Okay, so first of all, sorry for taking so long to reply. I have a three-year-old, and stuff got crazy yesterday. I'm also likely not in the same time zone as you, so it's morning here. I don't know how helpful this is going to be, but this is what I have. What you're describing is really hard. Families bring up all sorts of weird emotional reactions. My family was pretty dysfunctional when I was growing up. Today I'm 39, and have had a lot of therapy. But still, I visit my older brother who lives in another country. And every time for the first few days or week, we're prickly with each other. Then we have a huge fight, a real conversation, and get on okay till I leave. Repeat at next visit. I can't for the life of me figure out why it happens or how to not do it. My point being that one, we have very strong emotional reactions to family. They can push really deep primal buttons. So first step is don't give yourself a hard time about the reaction you're having. It's not stupid, it's not embarrassing, it's normal, and it's okay. It sucks and you want to do something about it, but the very first step to doing that is to not judge yourself for the reaction or the feelings. Give yourself a break. Take the angst out of it. 
Tell yourself, okay, my family really pushes my buttons. It's not their fault, it's not my fault, it just is. Now what could I do about it? Two, in terms of dealing with the feelings being triggered by your family, I'm gonna say no offense intended. You sound quite young. And from what you recount, your family sounds a bit overbearing. This can cause a bit of trouble with a process that normally happens in teens, 20s. Bear with me, I'm going to be a bit long-winded. In early adolescence, usually we emotionally interact with our parents from a position of underling. We do things because our parents make us and it feels powerless. We feel like they are part of us and have a right to know everything about us. We rebel against this in our teens or 20s and move away from our parents and later can interact with them as adults from a position of independence. The most important change that takes place is in our thinking about the relationship or power. An example is, as a kid, I had to go to church because mum made me. It sucked. I was bored, but I had to go. I also couldn't say I didn't believe in God because it would have upset her. It was a really powerless feeling. My thinking in the situation was, ugh, I don't want to go, but I have no choice. Life is so unfair, etc. Now, as an adult, if she wanted me to go to church, I know, as an adult, that it's my choice. Even if I feel like I have to go, because it would cause so much hassle to say no. My thinking is more... Uh, I don't believe in this, and I don't want to go. Is it worth the hassle it will cause with mom to say no? Not really. Guess I have to go then. The change is in your thinking, in starting to experience yourself as an individual, rather than just as part of your family whole, in realizing you don't have to tell your family everything about what you believe, or who you are, and that that's okay. It's totally okay to not share beliefs, to hear family members say things and think, oh man, really? And say out loud, yeah, sure, Dad. Nobody's owed your inner thoughts, feelings, or beliefs unless you choose to share them, not even your family. So yikes, not sure if any of this is helpful. But here's the suggestion. When you can manage it, get therapy. It will help you work through a lot of this stuff, and it's important going forward for relationships, etc. In the meantime, as an experiment, try to imagine yourself as an independent entity from all your family. Think about all the things you feel you have to conceal and decide it's okay not to tell them. Make an actual list of what things you're worried about them knowing, and things you can say, ways you can handle it if it comes up. Actually write it down, every single possible situation you can think of. It sounds crazy, but trust me, it helps. Decide to just try it for two weeks, and then reevaluate if you feel comfortable not telling. This is so your brain doesn't start trying to panic about it. It's only temporary. The suggestion above, which I didn't show, about propanolol is a good one. For situational anxiety, it can be fantastic. Look into whether there are any online script services where you live. Here you can have an online appointment and get a script faxed to a pharmacy. Otherwise, I'm not joking, make up a reason to see a doctor. Say you have a lump on some body part. Say you have a pain somewhere. Then when you get in a room alone with a doctor, explain the situation. They can help. I'm a GP where I live, and I can't tell you the number of young people who do this to get around parents knowing their medical business. And again, it's okay to not tell your parents your business. It doesn't mean anything is wrong. It's just part of becoming an independent adult, but doing it on hard mode when you have parents who aren't on board. From Mindful Mindsets, Practice Beats Planning. A university professor teaching a photography class conducted an experiment on his students. Half the students were told that they would be graded on the number of photographs they produced that semester. If they created a hundred reasonably quality photographs, they would get an A. The other half of the class was told that they would be graded only on the quality of the best photograph that they produced. So which group produced the best photos? Overwhelmingly, the first group. The group that merely had to create 100 photos. Why? We often think quality over quantity. Preparation and planning are key. But it turns out in learning a new skill, so long as we are intrinsically motivated, practice is the most important thing. Getting the reps in. The students that had to create 100 images did far more work with the cameras than did the other students. Naturally, out of curiosity, they experimented with different aperture times, lighting, development techniques, and so on. So they became better photographers and ultimately produced more high quality pictures. Preparation and planning is crucial when you only have one shot at something. If you want to blow away your girlfriend when you propose to her, you better plan. Thankfully, General Eisenhower didn't forgo planning and decided to just practice D-Day. But for things in life that we can do over and over, throwing ourselves into them is much better than planning. Most people want to find the perfect diet or the perfect workout 
before they try to get fit. The truth is designing a perfect workout doesn't help you lose weight. Moreover, actually starting a workout will let you know what works for you and what doesn't far faster than any planning ever could. Taking action will always move you closer to your goals than preparing to take action. To flip another idiom on its head, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing poorly, until you can learn to do it well. I'm putting this idea into practice with my writing. I have a strong perfectionist tendency. This is even more true for me with writing, where perfection is impossible. So I like to plan and prepare to write the perfect article. Ultimately, this planning serves as procrastination more than anything else. If I want to write one good article, one article worth publishing, I will have far more success if I write 100 articles than if I tried to only write one great article. I will learn so much more about what to say by writing 100 articles than I would by searching for the one topic I want to discuss. Often when I sit down to write these articles, I change what I want to say halfway through. I only learn what is worth writing by actually attempting to write. The same is true for whatever you are trying to do. So get to it. Stop planning and start practicing. Have a bias toward action, because we can only get good at things by first doing those things badly. Hi Daddy Jose replied, I might have an idea to build on that. About a year or so ago, I started working out in a very similar way to how I suggest here. I had a broad goal to simply be active every day, whether that meant weightlifting, yoga, cardio, basketball, cycling, or whatever. I tried to make sure I did something every day. Over time, I've gotten so much better as to what works for me, and I've learned a lot about how to work out more specifically to get the results I want. Since the pandemic, I've obviously been limited in my options, and I've begun focusing primarily on bodyweight exercises I can do at home. Since I'm focused into a more specific type of workout, I've begun to delve deeper into proper technique, doing a proper push-up, crunch, pull-up, etc. What I've realized is that even though overall I'm putting out less reps on any given exercise, by being mindful of proper technique, I'm actually able to gain a lot more and be safer in the long run. I think this approach could be a good analogy for other areas as well. To get as much output as possible while still being mindful and aware of any techniques that you learn along the way kind of reminds me of perfect practice makes perfect, though I might prefer something along the lines of Thoughtful practice produces thoughtful work, or something like that. Of course, I'm mostly past the initial stage of experimentation and finding out what works for me and what doesn't.